call the school committee to order. Call, call the selectmen to order. Um, welcome everybody to tonight's financial forum. Um, I want to extend my appreciation to RCTV for generously providing the use of their studio for tonight's meeting. Um, we have rep. It's not working. Is that it? is that any better or any different? No. Okay. Um, we have representatives from the board of selectmen, the school committee, and the town departments to provide answers to anybody's questions. Um, just to give a brief summary, the ballot question reads in part, shall the town of Reading be allowed to assess an additional $4.15 in real estate and personal property taxes for the school's public safety and general government for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2018? If you haven't read the full text of the question, I would invite you to do so before the next meeting, uh, before, the, before next Tuesday, sorry. Um, I also want to welcome any viewers from at home if they're out there. Um, tonight we're going to hear um, the needs of the different areas of town government and what the override will and will not do for services in the town and why the override is necessary. I've been on the Finance Committee since 2014 and continue to marvel at the ability of the town departments to manage within the constraints of Proposition 2 and a half. But as you'll hear tonight, uh, the cost of providing town services is rising faster than the restrictions on the ability of the town to raise revenue. Hopefully we'll answer everybody's concerns tonight and you will all leave here with a better understanding of the override question and be ready to vote on April 3rd. We've had many questions submitted and we will also be taking questions from anybody in the audience. Um, in order for everyone to get a chance to speak, we want to try to limit everyone's comments to two minutes. Um, hopefully this will be enough time for everyone to provide input. Um, before we start, um, does anybody uh, have any comments uh, from up here? Um, if not, we'll go right into questions. Um, Peter, do we have to call ourselves to order? We, we are. We did. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, Yes, it, this is a um, wireless mic. Um, well, he's, he's ready, so. Good evening, my name is Bill Brown. I hope right. you can, huh? There you go, okay. All right, can you hear me now? Thank you, but I'm here anyways. Um, my question to you, as I read the override question, it breaks down the school department in the three different sections. That cannot happen. Massachusetts state law section, uh, chapter 71, section 34, we must vote one budget. We cannot tell the uh, school committee how they shall spend the money. And that's, if you go back on chapter 59, section 21C, use of ad additional taxing authority, and I'll leave this with you if you'd like it. It says, these dollars are considered earmarked because they cannot be raised in the tax levy unless the community appropriates it for the purpose stated. The community can, but town meeting cannot. So I think, in my opinion, the question, the when it comes to town meeting, it will be invalid. So. Thank you. Um, anybody, uh, I guess, from the selectman side want to address that or? Uh? I, well, well I, I spoke with or emailed with town council. Um, I think some of the answer is in our packet from last night. I won't, for the sake of time, go into it. But uh, town council uh, stated that it was okay for the appropriating body for the override, which is the Board of Selectmen, to specify where the money is going. But that town meeting, once it gets, when it votes the budget, 
it can only vote one school member. And, and so. Uh, and it's a re Town meeting cannot vote that line item. And they will vote the school budget at the town meeting. The latest guidance from the state on override questions does give an example of specifying funds, say, for uh, school athletics in an override question. That, that is a legal override question. Um, it's similar here um, in, in this override. Yes, the question may be legal. Yeah. The town meeting cannot do that. That's they right. only vote the bottom line. That's right. And therefore, the way the ballot question is written, town meeting cannot vote them funds. My opinion. So, so as I understand it, we have guidance uh, from town council that the way the question is written, that not only it passed the uh, passed the need for the voters, plus it can carry on the town meeting written that way. And I suspect that town council will be at town meeting the night we have this discussion and we'll be able to address it. Okay, um, we'll start off with um, just a, a general question about the Proposition 2 and a half override um, and uh, the fact that one hasn't been done in Reading since uh, in 15 years um, and then con contrast it with um, the vote that we had on the library a few years ago. Um, I don't know, I guess Bob would probably be the uh, best one for that. Um, thanks, uh, Bob Lurlau, Shirt Town Manager. The um, recent vote, two votes actually on the library were what's known as debt exclusions. I got that right, Bill. Um, those are, if you will, temporary increases to taxes to, for a specific purpose with a specific period of time. Um, as the high school project was also done as a debt exclusion, um, each of those will be fully repaid at some point and the taxes levied for each project will vanish. An override, an operating override, is a permanent increase to the tax base of whatever amount it is, and in the future that amount increased by 2.5% a year. So there is a fundamental difference between a debt or capital exclusion, which are meant for one-time expenses, be it a $100 million school or a $50,000 piece of equipment, uh, whereas an operating override uh, is not meant to be a one-time uh, expense. Um, if I could just add to that, um, specific to the high school and to the library, those come off in 2024 and 2025, is that right? Right. So that th they are time limited and in fact they will be coming off 2024, 2025. Yeah, and as of um, the current uh, tax year, an average home in Reading is paying $340 combined for the high school and the library, and that will go to zero again. Uh, one of them goes away in 2024, the second goes away in 2025. So those funds will vanish from your tax bill, not to say they won't be replaced uh, by annual increases. Um, it's also noted that there's a big difference between the override request this year and the one that we had last year. Um, and the question is, does it fund the same items? And how can it be that this one is much smaller than the last one and yet can still cover the needs of the town? Um, I can answer part of that question um, uh, and <coughs> John to answer for sure. the schools. Um, there are less requests on the town side uh, than there was two years ago. Um, the, the tremendous focus uh, is on public safety for the town side of uh, this current override. There were public safety and several other things in the last request. Um, beyond specific items in the town or school budget, it was also a conscious effort to not come back to the taxpayer for at least 10 years and to add funds that would allow us to have sustainability. Um, so a few hundred thousand dollars a year was built into the number to be spent on debt and capital in the early years and then released to the operating budget as needed so that we could guarantee the taxpayers that we would not ask them again for 10 years. Um, this our override has no such guarantee, not that a guarantee is, is really ironclad in any event. Um, 
you ask me how long this one will last, um, I would have to candidly say probably five years without too much trouble, but I can't say much further than five years. It's just too difficult to predict. Whereas uh, two years ago, I would have very confidently said it would have lasted for 10 years. This one, I don't know. I don't think it will last for 10 years. We don't know. John? So on the school side, the, the requests from uh, this year and from the October 2016 override are fairly similar. The, the focus on both have been on classroom teachers, and you, you see that in and um, there's, there's a little bit of a shift um, from the October 2016 override in terms of the type of teachers, but essentially it, it, it is the same. It's focused on uh, restoring um, some high school teachers has been cut over the last few years. Uh, it is to retain the seven middle school teachers, which would be reduced in the 2000, uh, FY 2019 balance budget and to also retain three elementary teachers that would be uh, reduced um, in the FY19 balance budget. Okay. Um, let me know if anybody out uh, in the um, stands have any questions, but um, otherwise I'll just keep going along with these. Um, I guess we'll uh, switch to public safety for a minute. Um, and uh, it says the the chiefs shared with the town and board of selectmen that they needed additional officers and firefighters to handle the needs of the town. Um, appreciate if they could uh, walk us through those needs and um, how the override is going to provide for the additional uh, resources. So. We did a staffing study last last summer of the entire police department. We did a staffing study last summer of the entire police department, uh, comparable to 22 communities um, that Reading compares to. And it came back that we need five additional officers. One would be a school resource officer, three would be assigned to the night shift, and one would fill the vacant day shift position that we have currently, uh, that we lost the position from last year uh, when we had to cut a over a year ago. So from the police department side, as the population has grown over the last 10 years, we have not, and we could really use the extra offices out in the streets, and that's where, and one for the schools, because uh, the schools, quite honestly, have become much more uh, involved than we thought when we first started that program 12 years ago. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Greg Burns, Fire Chief. Uh, what we've seen is, is also an increase to our call volume over the last, um, you know, well, it's, it's been a steady increase. And back in uh, 1987, the, the department was studied by an independent uh, company looking to site the Main Street Fire Station. They looked at a lot of things. Much of that report's outdated. But one of the things they, that is still relevant is the staffing. and. Uh, Back then, our, our call volume was about 2,500 per year. Today, it's 3,500 per year. That study in 1987 recommended an increase of uh, firefighters by the number of four. And our staffing is, is this, uh, similar. Uh, we also did a staffing study using the uh, 24 uh, communities identified by Finance Committee as comparable communities. We looked at a number of different areas, uh, salary budget, uh, um, number of supervisors, uh, number of uh, population uh, of each of the communities, whether or not they provide EMS services, whether they provide it like we do at the advanced life support level. And what we found was Reading's population was on the higher side. Um, our number of supervisors were, was, was low compared to our peers. Our salary expenditures were, was low compared to our peers. And if you looked at the number of uh, firefighters per 1,000, Reading was low. We had um, 1.78 firefighters per 1,000. The average of the 25 communities, and some, you know, number of communities smaller than us, the average was 1.97. So if to get us up to the average of our peer communities identified by Finance Committee would require four additional firefighters. One of the things that we're seeing is an increase in emergency medical responses. So. We have two firefighters that are assigned to the ambulance 24 hours a day. As the 
emergency medical calls go up, they're spending more and more time at the hospital, less time here providing the other part of what we do is fire protection. So, so by increasing us by four, those people would be assigned two shifts. It would uh, increase our, our shift size. It would also um, help us with the uh, overtime budget as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we'll uh, switch to um, the free cash. Um, Sharon, if you could. Um, okay. Uh, probably best. Just under 8.6. I think this mic is working again. Is it? Someone turn it down. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think that one may be working. Yeah. 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 Ye
559? Yeah, 559. So in round numbers, you could say it's $500 for a $500,000 house. It's a little less than that. Um, when the actual tax bills are calculated next fall, which is when the override uh, would hit the tax bill, it, it's going to be different than that. We just can't know for sure. But uh, again, order of magnitude, just under $500 for a house, just over $500,000 assessed value. And there was another question about the senior tax relief and uh, what the impact of that was on residents' tax bills and how much the senior tax relief um, was that was put in this year. Victor Santanello, your tax assessor. There were about 193 people that applied for senior tax relief. 182 were granted. And it resulted in a shift in the residential rate of approximately uh, eight cents, as we shifted three hundred and sixty thousand dollars within the residential rate to pay for the tax relief. And what it translates into, at the average value of about five hundred and sixty thousand in Reading, about forty-five dollars. Okay. I don't understand that. Sorry. Can you, so does that mean that the average, if I am not one per if I am not a person getting the tax relief and I live in an average house in Reading, that I would have paid $45 more mm -hmm. to support the $346,000 of tax relief that went to our, our senior citizens in our community. Yeah, correct. Okay, I guess I do get it. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome anytime, Bill, anytime. <laughs> Probably should have hit you with the other assessor question, which was on the Walgreens property. Um, we talked about it a little beforehand, but uh, might as well. Walgreens value really hasn't changed. It's gone up on pace with other commercial properties in town, despite them being vacant. They've objected to this, but um, um, they shouldn't have left I'm town. <laughs> pretty. Uh, forceful when it comes to negotiating with them so we haven't seen a significant decrease in value okay for that property so victor excuse me so we are collecting kind of the, the full commercial value the, the tax based on full commercial value yes even though someone else isn't in there currently yes <coughs> Well, there, there have been concern raised about whether we've um, made enough cuts in other areas of the town budget and whether we really need the uh, $4.15 million. Um, from my own experience on the Finance Committee, um, I've seen a lot of cuts over the past five years, um, and certainly uh, the line has been held on increases, but I don't know if anybody else uh, <coughs> has more they want to say about that. Um, Do we want to say, I can, I mean, I think we've been saying this all, uh, quite frequently about on the schools, we've cut over the last five years about $4 million. <coughs> and that's real, um, that's real cuts in services and programs and eventually the outcomes that we can get for, for children. So um, I, there's, there's an enormous amount of data on the school committee website. There's an enormous amount of data on the Yes for Reading website that really detail out um, the nature of all these cuts over the years. And I, I would, are we getting to a, this, the cuts for FY19 or should we just give that highlight now? Um, yeah, I think, um, well, w without the override, um, there will be more cuts um, to the school committee, so. Right, so I, I would think people are pretty familiar with what those cuts are which the most significant is, one of the most significant is basically the, we, we will not be able to fund the middle school model, which has been a successful model in this community for something like 30 years. The middle school, if you look at the, the results of our middle school, 
um, we're one of the few districts that has strong results and no issues at the middle school level, which is the level where students are sort of going through their greatest developmental challenges. So they have to get through this awkward period in their life and their development, and they have to learn a tremendous amount and be ready for high school. And the middle school model enables that success. And this cut is going to take away the middle school model, which has the direct effects are increases in the amount of um, students that will be in advisory sessions, the reduction of sixth grade, in, uh, which sixth grade has a double block of English language, and that second block will be removed. And that is a piece that we feel is really promoting strong outcomes for our students all the way through the high school. It also has an impact of reducing time that's really critical for um, special education students who need um, additional services or tutoring or as, as part of an IEP, they would be able to, in sixth grade, go out of, t take that second English block. So they fundamentally don't miss English. They don't miss important extracurriculars, which for our students, co-curriculars, extracurriculars are an important part of the overall education development. So it, that's a big impact, especially to one of our most vulnerable populations. And then it eliminates the seventh and eighth grade foreign language, so students will not get to study Spanish and French in seventh and eighth grade. Currently, when they do that, that gets them year one of their programs done. And when they come to the high school, they start basically in Spanish or French too. That enables them to get to an AP level quite easily, an honors, an honors or an AP level quite easily as they graduate high school, enabling them to put together a strong resume for college. So we are, that cut is definitely happening. Um, I think there are, cut, there are teacher cuts throughout the district, there's tutor cuts, um, probably Dr. Doherty or Ms. Uh, Stout have all the rest of the cuts off the top of their head or, or yeah. uh, one of the other members. Right. And, and we'd also need to cut some elementary school teachers, and that's going to raise our class sizes in grades three to five, Dr. Doherty. That right? is correct. Um, above what's been proven is optimal for learning. So this will have impact next year from elementary school and the middle school, and our high school had lost six educators uh, from previous cuts. I think that, uh, you know, just to, to go uh, expand on what, or what Elaine said, uh, that middle school cut is often referred to as the foreign language cut middle school. It's, it's much more than that, as, as Elaine just yep. outlined. So Correct. it's the middle school model, which has uh, been, been in this <laughs> district for over 30 years. Over, over 30 years. And, and, Know, we're not not in a position to see that go away. Yes. Um, an important caveat of the middle school model that is being preserved. People sometimes ask why cut foreign language, why not piecemeal things around in the middle school? And the reason is because an important <coughs> element of the middle school model is being preserved. And that's the organization around the students. So in our middle school model, our teachers meet on teams. Our students are on teams. So the same teachers know the same students. And that way, when they meet, they get to discuss how students are doing across the disciplines, as opposed to the junior high school model, where, um, where teachers would meet with their other discipline um, colleagues. So. English language arts would meet with English language arts teachers. Social studies would meet with social studies teachers. In this middle school model, the, the teachers across those disciplines meet. So they know if someone is having trouble in English and they figure out that someone is having trouble in social studies and they start pulling things together. So they really have their kids in the radar. And if we didn't take the chunk out of foreign language and ELA in sixth grade, the foreign language in seventh and eighth, then we would start not to have those teams of teachers who are focusing on our students and enabling them to succeed. And so that's one of the questions that we've been asked. So an important element of the middle school model is being preserved despite these cuts, but it's not enough. In order to do that, as was said, we're losing foreign language and that other ELA block that no, enables <coughs> students to get the services that they need without losing their time learning English. Thank you. Oh, Bill. Um, as the 
Finance Committee considered pushing the Board of Selectmen to sell some of our vacant land. Uh, there's a land on Oakland Road that's been off the tax rolls since 1937. The selectmen are authorized to sell it since 1937. We've looked at it for everything except the dog pound, I think, and there's roughly 10 to 12 house lots. And running today, $200,000 for a house lot is not bad. I know it will not help the operating budget, but it would help pay for uh, some of the capital items. And uh, keep on pushing them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not <coughs> sure whether that uh, land is justifies $200,000 a lot because it's a giant rock, but. Uh, <laughs> get on, get on the saga to see what they pay for the land down there. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Mr. Chair, can I take yep. a, a crack at that? So I think it was one or two town meetings ago. Mm -hmm. um, it actually did come, uh, it was voted uh, to allow basically the selectmen uh, to figure out or dispose of that property. And I think at that meeting and at subsequent meetings, we committed to a process by which we'll look at that. Um, yes, we could sell it for uh, house lots. That's, that's one thing um, that's potential use. But we've identified a lot of other uses, a lot of other needs in this town that we now have a piece of property that we own that could be looked at. You know, for example, we know we need to have a new <coughs> senior center. Um, the one that we have right now is completely inadequate um, given the growth of the elderly population in town. Um, people have talked about a teen center. People have talked about other kinds of things. And so before we go out and just say, let's just sell it for more houses, uh, you know, we, you know, I know we talked about it and we committed a town meeting that we would go through a process that look, before we dispose of it, to look at what we really need it for. We might need some other things. So yes, we'll get a one-time kind of bump. It's not going to basically fulfill um, what we need on the operating budget. And I think it's a, it's a town resource. I think we really need to look hard at that and any other piece of land that we own before we just say, you know, do a fire sale and just sell it to the highest bidder or just so that we can fund a one-time capital thing. It's a, it's a pro piece of property that I think needs to be looked at um, really carefully. We committed to do that and, um, you know, we'll do that. Thank you. Can I respond to that, please? So it's very important you don't mix apples and oranges. That is a capital asset of the town. And as a capital asset of the town, if it went on the block tomorrow and was sold, um, the most logical place is that it would go into the capital fund. Now, how does that relate to the override? It doesn't relate at all to the override because the override is, is strictly designed around operating expenses. So it really kind of clouds the issue to talk about a capital asset that really doesn't fit into the discussion about override, frankly. So I think the idea of study is it, it has, and I realize it's, you know, this is government, okay? It, it moves slow. There's no question about that. We all kind of know that because we're all involved. The important thing to realize is that <clears throat> What town meeting said to us was not that we could sell it, but that we could offer it, number one. Um, number two, it said that that was under the circumstances that it was deemed surplus. And frankly, based on you know the, the point that Barry has just made, um, we're not convinced that it's a surplus capital asset. And until such time as it is deemed completely surplus, active marketing of it doesn't make any sense at all and in the context of a two and a half override it really is an apples and oranges thing bill and they don't match um, I guess, um, <coughs> next uh, there's a question about how uh, the Average tax dollar gets spent in the town of Reading. Um, Bob, I don't know if you have any statistics on that. Um, if you look at um, our total spend, as opposed, uh, first of all, we have different sources of revenues. Property taxes is just one of them, but let's just pretend that uh, property taxes are spent the same way as all revenue. Um, in the general fund, 45% of all tax dollars go to the schools. 18% uh, go to benefits for retirees and employees. 8% go to capital and debt expenses. And then on the town side, uh, public safety 11%, public work 6%, facilities 
uh, library 2%, public services 2%, and administrative services and finance, in other words, town hall, is about 3%. <coughs> and it should be pointed out that uh, much of finance is a shared resource between uh, the schools and the light department in terms of the work they do. So again, schools 45%, uh, benefits and capital 25%, town 30% is an approximation. Is Reading unique in needing an override? Um, how are other towns managing the need for additional revenues? And um, what is the experience of other towns in terms of Proposition 2 and a half overrides? Um, um, we've, we've studied um, economic development extensively and looked at our peer communities and met with all of our peer communities. There's, there's 24, 25 of them. Um, the fairest summary of that is that if you could describe a community in one of two ways, it's either residential or commercial. Commercial communities do not need operating overs, overrides either at all or very often. Um, that's especially true in, in commercial communities that have vacant land. So for instance, Burlington has so much commercial property. Um, generally speaking, the cost of municipal services for commercial property is significantly less than residential because there's no school children. Um, when a town such as Burlington, in addition, has vacant land, they can continue to add commercial development. So uh, communities such as Burlington, they're just the locally the best example, um, do not need operating overrides. Um, towns where the residential percentage is 85% or higher, uh, Reddings is about 92 or 93, um, do need operating overrides more often, or at least that's historically what has happened. I won't use the word need. Um, if you sorted the 25 <coughs> communities by percent of residential tax base, Reading is in about the top five or six. Um, all of our peers have had operating overrides at least once, and in some cases twice, since the last successful override in Reading. So let me just repeat that. Since the last 15 years, um, communities that look like Reading or, or have a higher percent of residential have passed at least one override since then, or two, compared to when Reading has not done any. So it is not unusual for Reading to be in this situation. It's something that we've discussed for 10 years. It's something that we have pushed off and creatively figured out solutions. But as uh, the school committee and the superintendent have described, and as the town has also experienced, we're at the point where we can't uh, clever our way out of the issue. We have to cut services. There's just no options. If there's no more revenue, uh, an earlier question was, can we reduce costs to balance the budget? And of course, the answer is absolutely yes. But we, can, if we're going to reduce uh, expenses, we are going to reduce services. We can't keep the same service levels. So this is not unusual at all. The unusual part probably is that Reading has lasted for 15 years. Uh, well, I hate to keep peppering you with questions, Bob, but uh, <laughs> um, how will we fund needed capital budget items such as kill them in the DPW garage in the future, and will that mean more debt? Well, the Finance Committee has a policy. Um, right now, kill them as either a significant repair or a replacement, whichever it may be would be large enough to fall under the debt exclusion uh, portion of FinCom's policy. Not to say FinCom's policy is law, but I don't see a reasonable way for us to afford an elementary school inside the tax levy as had been done in the past. Mm -hmm. And just to revisit what happened with Wood End and, and Barrows, I understand some of the motivation. Um, I think it was a mistake not to go to the taxpayers and ask for debt exclusions for both those schools because it crowded out the operating budgets and the rest of the capital budgets for some time and significantly hurt the town. Um, the reason the FinCom policy was introduced was to not make that mistake again. Uh, if the community does or does not want to support a significant expense, it should not crowd out operating budgets. It should be separate because, again, it's a one-time capital cost. Um, the DPW garage is very similar and yet possibly quite different in the sense that we know for a school that we will 
have MSBA support or not. And it's a fairly simple, it's very different math, but it's a fairly simple calculation. Um, were we to build a DPW garage, we will have at least one other community as a partner and possibly more. Uh, we don't believe we can purchase land to do it. We believe we'd, we'd be involved in a very long-term lease. The summary of, of my remarks will be the finance will be very complex for that transaction. I don't know if we would need to go outside the operating budget or not yet. Uh, by its nature, if we were just building a garage all by ourselves on a piece of land that we owned, we absolutely would have to ask taxpayers for money. But where this is a complex uh, issue that uh, is clearly going to involve funding from the state, at least as a request, a significant request, we just don't know. The other uh, third project that has been mentioned tonight that's not nearly as large, but the need for a senior center is clear. Um, whether that's a renovation to the current building or a relocation, none of us know. Um, it's, it's a priority, but it's not a high priority, honestly. Uh, it's a nice to have, um, you know, quite honestly. And uh, it's hard to know if we could afford to do that inside the levy or outside the levy because it depends on the size of the, uh, the cost. Um, we received some criticism two years ago when the override uh, was brought in October 16 that a lot of people didn't know that an operating override was necessary and they would would have thought twice about voting for a library project. Best way to communicate with people is to put a ballot question on and ask them for money because I can assure you that in meetings like this for years it was discussed that an operating override was absolutely going to be needed whether or not a new library or a renovated library was done. Um, I don't doubt that people didn't hear it but that's not to say we didn't say it. So we have been ex exceptionally clear since October of 16 that there are, are these large projects in the community, <coughs> plus maybe there's a project we don't know about yet um, that will absolutely require additional funding from taxpayers at some point in some way. Thank you. Um, I guess this question is for the um, Executive Board, Board of Selectmen, has it officially changed your name yet? Or is um, have we looked at the ability to raise additional funds through the use of fees and uh, then not have to raise as much money uh, under the tax base? Um, I mean, I just, I can take a crack at that. Um, we actually have raised some fees. Um, those of you who take the commuter rail into Boston, um, your $25 sticker that got you into the compost and allowed you to park at allowable spaces now costs $150. I can tell you um, my phone blew up the second we did that. Um, we've also raised some fees on, um, on, on, on some permitting. Um, but if you look at what we can garner from fees, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drop in the bucket, right, compared to, to what the needs are. Um, you know, fees are just are, are, are one way of doing revenue, but does not replace the need for, um, for an operating override. Um, I think the, the broader question that maybe what the, the person who had done, th done that is, is not only you know, what kind of fees can you raise to increase the budget, but what can you do to grow the economic pie? That's a bigger and more important question to ask because Proposition 2.5, as we all know, allows you only to raise taxes 2.5%, but the other underlying clause is plus new growth. And if you're a town like Burlington and Woburn and you put up another mall, that's a lot of new growth. In Reading, there's not a lot of room for a new growth. Mr. Robinson can build a deck on his property, and Mr. Santanella will come by and look at it, and now we'll get a couple extra dollars on that. Um, someone else can build a new house. That's the kind of new growth. So what the board has done is really looked at where the strategic opportunities are to kind of grow the economic pie. Someone had alluded to the, to the, DPW, to the DPW garage. Moving that frees up seven acres of land right off the highway for prime economic development. Um, we had one estimate that would say that that could lead to not only there, but just sort of bringing up the other properties around it, an additional $3 million of taxes per year. Um, so um, that's going to enable us to kind of grow the pie so that maybe we don't need as many overrides or as, as severe. Um, we know that there are 16 projects of various sizes and levels, four of which are downtown, which will add about $100 million of private investment in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, 
but there are smaller projects, little um, subdivisions, uh, a, couple, a couple of, of houses where we know they're going to pull permits. Um, when, when Bob does the budget every year, he conservatively estimates that we're going to have about $550,000 of new growth per year. Um, and that's the right way to do it because you don't know when these projects are going to come to fruition. We don't know when the economy is going to go up or down. Over the last three years, our new growth numbers have been 700, 800, and 900. We budget 550. The 16 projects that we know we're going to, or that we're hoping that get into the ground have been estimated by our assessor that's going to give us um, north of a million dollars of new growth over the next two, three, four, five years. So when Bob alludes to that, he doesn't know how long the override is going to last for. Part of that magic equation, what's going to give this override legs, is that new growth. So that's why the selectmen, um, really for the last, you know, since I've been on the board for three years and even longer, Mr. Halsey's been on the board, um, have really looked at laser focus on creating, uh, maximizing the economic opportunities that we have to utilize and strategically and thoughtfully grow the town without really changing the complexion of the town. That's really the only way that Reading is going to survive economically unless, unless everybody is just happy to say, okay, every three years come knock at my door and ask me for another three or four million. That's the only way that we're going to fund the service level that we have, that we're accustomed to, without expanding new growth. And, and, and uh, new growth does not replace the need for an override, but what we're hoping happens is that it makes them less frequent we can, uh, and we don't have to ask for as much. So that's kind of the competing strategy. It does not mean that we don't need the override this year just because we're investing downtown. I don't want people to think that. Um, I want people to understand that this is really a two-prong approach. This override is going to get us through the next three, four, five years. And if these projects can get into the ground, if we can get this new growth, we're going to be able to take a breath and do the things that we really need to do. Like look at do we need a senior center? Let's look at Killam. Let's look at, um, you know, kind of our master planning. The millions of things that the board could not do over the last 18 months because we're really trying to focus on salvaging um, our, you know, our, our financial stability. So um, that's why this we're at a critical juncture, and I don't want people to think that if we do one, we don't need the other. Excuse so. me, can I, can, I, can I kind of expand on that because Barry points out what is what most people don't stop to understand is the amount of moving parts that go into this. I mean, this question was kicked off around fees, and that's a piece of the moving parts. You know, one of the things about fees that people often don't actually realize is that when the, the parking fee, for example, was expanded, it was expanded tied to one thing, what it costs to actually maintain that spot. You cannot charge a fee in the state of Massachusetts as a municipality that you can't directly connect to an expense. And so that being the case, when that fee was raised, we already recognized that in order to be able to maintain that per sticker um, based on the numbers that we had, it actually costs us about $222 to maintain that parking space. So we felt that we couldn't go there, um, but it went to 150. And what did it do? When it was, this really ties to an earlier question too of how is how are you economizing? How are you looking at ways to make it more palatable um, to the to the residential taxpayer? Well, when that $150 fee comes in instead of a $25 fee, what it does is it releases operational money that has previously been spent to maintain the expenses of those parking places. So you really got to almost get at 30,000 feet and look at this thing to understand the amount of moving parts. It's not as simple as raise the parking fees and all of a sudden that's going to, you know, eliminate a certain need. It just doesn't, it doesn't work that way exactly. It has an impact. It's small. Um, but, you know, the, the other piece of this thing that, that Barry is talking about, and, and he's absolutely right about this is a project that's been in, in the works now for a handful of years to really be focused on the expansion of, of reoccurring revenue to the town that is not necessarily directly on the back of the current amount of homeowners at any given moment in time. And so one of the things that you, you, know, you may hear is, well, um, why do you have, why do you have Redding Woods? Why do you have 
uh, all the different projects, Johnson Woods. You know, one of the things that actually happens that people don't recognize is that not only are you expanding, you know, a, a piece of land that was otherwise not taxed at a, such a high rate, if you do it, which we have actually done without we've caused certain expenses to occur, but they haven't, I don't believe, overridden. Uh, Reading Woods, for example, I think has nine or 12 children in, in the school system, um, yet it creates a couple million dollars worth of revenue. So when you think about that, um, not only did it create the revenue through that particular type of growth, one of the things that we've seen over and over now for the last few years is a simple thing. Um, Sharon, like our excise receipts are climbing exponentially, aren't they? And it's not just because we all wanted to go get a new car. We have more people living here, therefore more cars are being purchased. I mean, the amount of moving parts that go into this thing is not as cut and dried as the average taxpayer might think. And so when they question how anybody who has financial oversight is looking at this, they've got to understand the all the different pieces that come into the the giant pie of money that you know ends up getting divided back out. So I really would echo what um, Barry is saying about the fact that when you think about a project like moving the DPW, will you have expense? Yes. Would you mind spending a dollar to make three? The average person would say, yeah, that's a pretty good thing. You know, why wouldn't I invest a dollar to get three dollars back? That's kind of the thing we're talking about here. If what you're able to do is invest in the relocation of a public works facility, for example, and then recreate the opportunity for, you know, particularly commercial development that's got all kinds of upside opportunity, including, you know, at some point, you know, if we're able to develop a certain commercial base in the commercial area, it opens itself to how we might be able to adjust who pays how much tax? Is it commercial? Is it business? You know, at the moment, it's re responsible people can argue both sides of that this minute, and I, and I agree with that. Um, at the moment, the prevailing um, decision has been that what you do is you try to protect that small slice till you get it to be a larger slice so that you can then expand, you know, how commercial can impact what goes on in residential. So I, I, much as, believe me, I'm a pretty simple guy, but this is not a simple problem. Um, I'd love to just say it's just arithmetic, but it, it's really a lot more than that. So it's not as simple as let's raise some fees and that's gonna solve the problem. And none of that, frankly, all of the things that Barry talked about and I'm talking to you about right now, have a minimal impact currently on the need for an override. We just can't get there fast enough without the infusion of capital into the operating account, and that can only be accomplished under law um, with the passage of an override. So. Mr. Chair, could you repeat the question, please? <laughs> um, basically goes back to... Uh, it was a fee question. Fee yes, question. it was. Just, have, you examined have we looked at all the fees? <laughs> have we looked at all the fees we could raise so that we wouldn't have to need as much money uh, through taxes. Right. So, so um, just to answer th that question about fees, I think we have to be, I'm not opposed to, in general, to raising fees, but we have to be careful about, you know, we could r charge a fee for every service we provide in town, um, and, and fees are, can be viewed as another way of just raising your taxes, but targeting a subpopulation. So, you know, your, your one hand may giveth while the other hand taketh away. So, so that, that's my, I think we just have to be careful about using fees to solve our problem because it's just another way of taking your money. If I, if I could just comment quickly on the um, school side, the fees, because I believe not this budget year, uh, but the previous two, we, we have fees that we have had to raise in order to not cut programs. So we have raised the athletic fees, we've raised the fees in full day K, and we raised <coughs> the fees in the RISE preschool. At the same time that we've been raising the fees, there's been an increase in our population of uh, which is called free and reduced lunch, or our uh, students and families who qualify basically <coughs> for assistance based on their income. 
and that in Reading had run for <coughs> about about seven or eight percent for an extended period of time, and it's running closer to ten percent. So at the same, t to Andy's point, at the same time that we're raising fees, these <coughs> fees we are also seeing more requests for assistance with the fees in families that can't quite support the fees. Um, at the same time, um, if anyone watches school committee meetings, they know one of the first things we do is called a consent agenda. And one of the things we do is we accept donations from the community. And all of you, all of the organizations are out there working with other organizations in the community to um, bring in funds that are used to supplement um, various aspects of the budget. It's very specific. It's, it's, uh, it's accounted to for by every penny. And in FY17, that was 161000 So if we didn't bring that money in, I guess we would have had to try to increase fees somewhere else, or we would have had to cut programs or not offer those programs. So I think it's important to understand that. And I just would add, um, when I looked at the number of new units or plans, I was at a FinCom meeting a few weeks ago, <coughs> and it listed the number of units. There's something like 230 new units on the books. Now, maybe they will all be very, uh, very small percentage of, sc of school children, but we don't know that for sure. So the new growth is outstanding. It means um, more, more children to educate potentially, and it means a bigger burden on our police and fire. So as, a as everything has sort of a plus and a minus, <coughs> or it has a pro and a con. Thank you. Um, related. Uh, or a somewhat related question on the school department. Uh, it says, the school department and the school committee requested more money than was included in the override amount. Can you please explain how the amount in the override will be used to rebuild what we have had to cut in the past five plus years? I think Do Dr. Doherty can answer that, but we didn't request, we requested $2.137 million, which was on January 30th, the selectmen voted a number. Um, uh, and the question is legitimate. It, we we got le we're getting less Thanks. money in the override than than we put forward. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. thought it was more yeah. money. Okay. Right. Yeah. So you want to Sure, I can uh, so as I as I mentioned earlier the the primary uh, focus of of the school committee request for the override budget is is classroom teachers. So that includes seven the seven middle school teachers that have been discussed uh, this evening, uh, five teachers from the high school that have been cut over the last couple of years, uh, to retain three elementary teachers, which I believe um, Sherry referred to. Um, it's it's also to really focus on things that we need to do for our classroom. So it includes um, it includes uh, curriculum updates and renewals, teacher training for for our staff so that the, they can um, implement the curriculum um, that that we're putting in for our students. Um, it's also to restore a computer technician so that we're able to keep uh, keep up with the uh, the maintenance and repair of our of our technology. It's also to add computer uh, so we can go closer to a, a five year replacement cycle as in, as opposed to right now we're at a eight year replacement cycle. Um, it's also to restore at some athletic cuts that would would be made in the, in the FY19 balance budget um, if that does not come to fruition. Um, but it also adds a, 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 some positions that are going to help move us to the to the next level and to make our curriculum more coordinated, both across a grade level from school to school and from K to 12. So there are two positions in here which are called curriculum coordinators that are going to work with teachers to make sure that a curriculum that's being taught in grade three at Joshua Eaton is going to be a very similar curriculum that's going to be taught at grade three in Wood End and all of our of our elementary schools. It also is going to strengthen our special education um, program development by adding a leadership position um, in, in that area as well. So it, it puts back a lot of the things that will be cut or have been cut, but it also builds capacity for, for the future and makes us um, move forward in a, in a better way for the kids. I think it, if I could just add, I think it, it brings back uh, it brings us actually back to the budget guidance when we when we first gave to the superintendent was first of all we have to fix the structural deficit right. uh, and be able to sustain that and uh, while we would have liked to have had uh, all of the the uh, positions in the override what 
what the number would, that was agreed upon kind of fits our, our first priorities, which is to fix the structural deficit. And as Dr. Daugherty uh, mentioned, uh, uh, do some of the things that uh, of a priority of the things that will help move the district forward. Uh, and that's the uh, curriculum coordinators. So, and, and I could just uh, add uh, back to that just I was the only one that didn't weigh in on the fee <laughs> discussion. <laughs> uh, no, one of the, uh, and I'll be brief, uh, <laughs> one of the, the things is that is important, and it goes back to the guidance uh, that we also gave the superintendent, is no gimmicks. We didn't want any gimmicks in our, in our uh, budget. Uh, that, and, and raising fees, I mean, you have to do those periodically. But you, that's Rob and Peter to pay Paul if you try and raise them every year uh, to solve a problem that's just going to be on the table next year. So we consciously looked at the fact that we raised fees last year uh, for athletics, I think the year before for uh, kindergarten and rise, uh, maybe. or uh, Anyway, uh, that's why we consciously went into this budget that we, we can't do that every year. It's a gimmick uh, that we just didn't want to approach this year. Thank you. Um, there's also a question on uh, whether a split tax rate would um, help to solve the budget shortfall. Uh, I know that we do have a, uh, technically have a split tax right now, but um, I guess the question would be whether if we had a higher uh, ratio for a commercial property, whether that could help solve the uh, budget shortfall. All a split tax rate does is redistribute the tax levy. So we don't make any more money. We're not allowed to charge any more. It just means uh, commercial properties pay more. Residential properties, obviously, would pay less. It's fair to say that the split tax rate that we have right at the moment was designed to create parity between commercial property owners and residential property owners on the topic of senior tax relief. And that was a number that we had, you know, that we had tried to work with. It's very small. It's, ti it's tiny because the cost of senior tax relief is tiny. And because it's a zero-sum game, that's just moving the shells around, you know, as, as, as Victor points out. There is not an, one additional dollar that comes in as a result of a split. The split that we did, however, was, was important because residential property owners and commercial property owners needed to fairly share in the cost of the senior tax relief. And the way the law was set up, you couldn't do that. You couldn't pass the cost of senior tax relief to anyone except residential people. It's a residential savings only move to residential taxpayers. In order to solve that problem, the tax, the, the Board of Selectmen have a, a very, very, very small slice of a split, but it created parity as close as, as close as Victor could figure it out to about 17 decimal points, so. Um. Um, also, I think in order to have any kind of significant savings to the residential taxpayer, the uh, amount that the commercial base would have to pay would be uh, uh, a lot higher compared to the benefit that the uh, the residents would receive. Um, and then um, there's another question, I guess this is kind of joint between the uh, well, a public safety question on ARCASA, the fact that the funds run out in 2019, um, and is there anything um, being done to um, think about funding it in 2019 and beyond? Um, will the override funding be used to support this program going forward? Um, if not, if it will not be, where will the money come from? Um, so right now, it is funded through September of 2019, our CASA is. I know this, none of the override will be used uh, for funding of our CASA. I know that myself, the town manager, and the superintendent will be meeting this summer to discuss exactly what we're going to do with our CASA and how we're going to move forward, whether it's a restructure or whether, whether uh, in the same format, we're not sure yet. We're going to have many meetings starting 
the summer. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, other questions uh, from anybody out there? Um, I think that's about it then. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, question right here. Oh. oh, you do have oh. one. Yes. <laughs> My name is Henrietta Movado. I live here in Raleigh, and I don't need that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> TV needs uh -oh. And it's very difficult to understand what you people are saying because of the this thing doesn't work, I understand. But I mean, I could barely understand what was going on. Okay, aside the fact, I have lived here since 1977, and when I, we moved up with my young family, we moved here because at that time they assured us that the tax rate was at 100%, and once you go to 100%, well, you are the top of the line, and that's it, you don't go anywhere else. Now I think it's gone to 200% since I have been here. And also, the school seems to have gone down rated-wise because people have looked at it. And I don't understand why. But my problem is I am a senior. I am on fixed income. I don't have that $500 coming in. Medicare or Social Security did not increase me that kind of money to supplement the $500. People are unemployed. My neighbor's been unemployed since last year, and she has been raised $200 a, a month on her um, mortgage. Now, how are people supposed to support this new override? I understand everybody has struggles, but I think this override is trying to push the seniors out into the poor house, which we are already there, I, like I said. I'm on fixed income. I don't have any money coming in from XYZ or anything. Whatever I get from Social Security, that's my pay. And I try to struggle to have my, you know, make ends meet with that and try to pay my taxes so I don't get a penalty on top of that. Now, I would like to know from you gentlemen and ladies, what do you suggest that people like me do D did in you order to, to, to Compensate for what you're trying to raise. Did you look into the senior tax relief? Yes, I don't. I don't qualify. You don't qualify. Okay. Um, yeah. This gives me a good opportunity. Maybe some folks are watching at home that don't read the newspaper or, you know, see me with my dog and pony show at the senior center. Um, the best time to come to the assessor's office is in August. If you receive a senior circuit breaker income tax credit when you do your income taxes for last calendar year, if you don't know what that is, ask your tax preparer what that is. If you qualify for that benefit, have owned and occupied any residence in Reading for 10 years and have no significant other assets like a second home, you can qualify for this exemption. It's a quick form. If your home's in a trust, bring the trust to us. We just have to review it to make sure that you qualify. Uh, the selectmen off, uh, for this fiscal year opted to double the amount of tax relief. It saved the average recipient 30% on that tax bill. Victor, could I just ask a follow-up question no. on that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, there, there, so there's means testing for the circuit breaker. Approximately, do you have a ballpark figure for uh, net value or net assets that you need to be under in order to get the circuit breaker? Or is that too complicated of a question to cover tonight? It, there's a couple of different levels, but in a nutshell, if you own and occupy a home, you have to pay 10% of your income uh, towards local property tax and a portion of your up to 50% of your water and sewer can be counted uh, <laughs> towards that local property tax portion of it to make the 10%. Uh, there's a couple of different levels um, whereby if you're uh, married, 
I think the income level might be 57,000. Uh, there's income levels up to 84,000 where people can partially qualify. Uh, home value cannot exceed 720,000. These are all state guidelines. So, so thanks. Can I just, just um, Mrs. Murata? Yes. Uh, okay, so um, in addition to the senior uh, tax relief program, which just Victor very, very nicely um, encapsulated, there are a couple of other programs that, um, that Victor's office actually runs um, that could help sort of um, ease the burden a little bit. One of them is a tax deferral program where you defer a portion of your taxes um, you know, while you're there. And then what happens is that when you sell the home, um, uh, you, or whatever your estate will, they'll get paid. Right. So well, enable, people don't advise that uh, oh. to be one of the. It's but as far as what he's point. saying, um, I don't apply. I don't qualify for any of those for some reason. My water bill is close to a thousand dollars a year. Yes, I understand. I have irrigation. It's a luxury for me, but it's convenient for me. And so the. Um, Circuit breaker has to do with the water bill. Only one year I made it by uh, $10, I think. That was it. Every year I, I bring my because I, I get the printout from the town and everything. I don't qualify. Yet my expenses are there, like everybody else. But like I said, my income is limited. And my expenses have to come out out of that limit amount that I get. And I struggle with it. So it isn't that I want to put my burden on someone else's shoulder. It's just the idea that if this override situation, and I'm not alone in this. When you talk to seniors, everybody says the same thing. A lot of people don't show up because either they don't know about. I didn't know about this meeting being held here tonight. I went to the library, and I went to the town hall. And I missed the last one they had because um, it w I also volunteer at school. And if it's the day that I'm there, I cannot be somewhere else. But I mean to say, I try to stay in contact with the town, try to keep up with what goes on as interest, not only just because I'm a senior, but as of interest, as to know what's going on. But I mean, a lot of things, I don't think they're publicized. Yes, they put them on the, uh, um, like he said, they, a lot of people don't read the newspaper anymore because newspaper costs money nowadays, even more than what it used to cost before because now everything is done on the phone, online. Not everybody has online situation or it's a whiz at doing online. I am one of them. I do not do anything online because I need help to have something like that to be done. So that's my struggle. How would you suggest they That's a good question. So, <laughs> um, I usually go to the senior center and try to read up if there's anything that, that's going on, that maybe that's posted, um, because I partake of the senior center. And like the gentleman said, yes, the senior <coughs> center is very outdated. People complain about that. But I need to go there for what I need, and for me, I find it convenient. But other people complain that it's very outdated, which it is. But if they don't have the funds, they don't have the funds. I don't know how you will get the, um, the information. Like for, in reference to something else, there's another meeting going on tomorrow night. Now, I have not seen any signs on Salem Street until today because I traveled that street. And in reference to that meeting of tomorrow night, it has to do with the B, the zoning or something, a new, right. new uh, condos going up on Lake Avenue. Now, in reference to condos, Redding Woods, there's, I don't know how many units there, five, 600 units, maybe more than that. There's so much um, revenue from that complex. How come Redding is always in deficit? I'm addressing the, the board. I don't know who is to answer, but I'm go, just qu asking go, going the back, question. Going back about a minute ago yeah. when you mentioned about Thank notification. You. Okay. We put stuffing in with the tax bills. So when you got your tax bill last year, there was another piece of paper in it advertising this exemption. Beyond that, 
I don't know what else we can do. Website, TV, newspaper, oh, and going straight to, straight to folks. Yes, and as far as, it's a question I get a lot, Bob, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, no, no. You know, they build all these new condos. Where does the money go? Right. It's not like the next year, oh, boy, we just found this money, and we're going to use it here. In our five- and ten-year pro uh, projections that we do, in consultation with uh, uh, Jean's office and her wonderful staff, Sharon, Bob, and myself, that money is factored into our budgets in the out years, which is perhaps why uh, Reading hasn't come before the town in so long asking for an override. But well, that money's so factored into the budgets. So and this is <coughs> rumor. I was given this information from someone that knows, that attends most of the meetings and very much involved with the town hall and with the polls and everything else that there is so much money in that mm -hmm. complex, right? We're not talking about 100,000 or 200,000. We're talking about millions of dollars. So if that money is there, yep. why is the override even being brought to, uh, try to be to fruition? There's not millions in tax dollars there. And just as an example, if you build a million dollar house, it raises about 13,000 in taxes. But as I said, as those condos come online, we have an expectation of our new growth number, which is plugged into the budgets in the out years. It's not like there's a free cash reserve sitting around. It's used right, right. for budget planning. Right, okay. But then what happens, my house got appraised so much more than what I think it's worth. So based on that, my tax bill went up. How do I compensate that when my house is not even worth how do I make them believe that? Every January. Oh, no. Oh. 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 Wow. Boy, wow. <laughs> she has the magic <laughs> power. <laughs> Every January, you have an opportunity to file an appeal with my office to challenge the value. And what I do is come out and inspect the property. Most of the time, it's, oh, gee, we have you down for three bathrooms. You only have two. We make the change. Or we might have your house listed in very good condition. <coughs> so we, have we make the change, and it brings the value in. If there's nothing obvious, we go to what's sold in the prior calendar year. That's how assessments are determined. How often do I go around making a new assessment? I make new assessments every year. Right. How often do we view homes? Right. Yes. The legal standard is once every nine years, we're required to view your home. Okay, so then uh, the other eight years, I guess you go on the books and say, oh, XYZ is 500000 Okay, so the next yeah. house is it's kind of the concept, but there's statistics and, you know, other checks and balances that we run. Towns broken up by various neighborhoods, style of home, age of home, yes. areas, and, and all that stuff is in taken into consideration. Yeah, I think sales so. are high because it's the poorest of the neighborhood, so, so homes get sold frequently. And they say, oh, you live in a, in a high sale neighborhood. I said, where's the high sale? I'd like to know that. But it's, it's calculated. I'm sorry. That's the way I feel. And my neighbors feel the same way. We live in a poorer section of Reading. And again, you can avail yourself of the public process that every other taxpayer and homeowner has in Reading. When you receive the actual tax bill at the end of December, you have until the first business day of February to file an abatement application with my office. We make it nice and easy. Stop by. Myself, my staff will help you fill it out. We'll look at your house and do a one-to-one -one comparison. It's what I we do for anybody I that applies. That I took time and I did the legwork of going around and checking homes around the neighborhood uh, that I had to present. Yes, I got, uh, so they lowered my taxes, I don't know, by $500 maybe, which it was appreciated and grateful, but after that it's been going. So it isn't that, that you know, I come to your office and yes, uh, you look at my information and say, oh yeah, this lady needs to be qualified for this and this. There's certain things that I have to do on my own in order to prove to you, right? 
Well, times change, and basically myself and my board do all that for you because most people are wholly unprepared to come in and challenge their assessment. So first step is inspect your property. Make any changes to the property based on what's there. And then what I do is review the sales. And when I do that, I look for two things. I look for sales that support my updated opinion of value, but I also do your homework by looking for sales to refute it, further lowering the value. Okay, well, thank you. That's we try to make it easy for folks. I wanted to express my opinion, and I wanted to find out not that how certain things work and how they get assessed. No, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to answer another part of your question, if I could. Yes. Okay. You asked kind of where are we spending the money? Why why can't we just kind of continue? Why can't we keep all the services? What's going on? So a couple of things. There are some things whose costs rise very, very quickly that we can't control. I'll pick just a couple of, as examples. One of them is health insurance bills. They're going to go up 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 percent. We have to come up with the money. Not a choice. We have to. My, my insurance has gone up, too. I have to come up with I, the money. I understand. That's the same. I understood. And, and that's exactly the same thing that's happening here. That's why the town doesn't suddenly say, oh, we have all sorts of money. Where, where can we spend it? Never the case. There's always a source, always a use. So health care is number one. Number two, we have to take care of what the state has told us to do for special education. We have to fund that ourselves and state aid that used to support it more supports it less. So they're spending less money telling us what to do. Our special education is up 12.1%, John, roughly, this year? Yeah, the yeah, district. Yeah, the district. Yeah. Uh, 12%. District. And you have to do it. It's not a choice. You can't, you can't uh, object to it and say, I'd, I'd like to have it reviewed. That's the number. So you take all those things that we have to do. We don't have a choice. And that represents 40% of our budget. And that's up 6% for next year. That means that everything else, everything else the town has to do, can go up about one and a half percent total, period. That's it. And you got to pay people. You got to keep the, the roads clear. You got to take care of all the services. You have to take care of the children and take care of all them through the schools. You have to do that with one percent. So we face that same crunch. But the idea that there's, there's this big amount of money from new growth, from whatever's going on, it's wonderful that it comes in. We have costs that are going up so fast. That helps, but it doesn't cover it all. And what happens is we cut, cut, cut. We've gone through enough cuts at this point that you, you, you cut into the bone, not around it, into it. You've heard specifically about what's happening for the schools. You've heard from the chiefs in terms of what needs to happen. That's where we are. So you know, if the override doesn't pass, you will see deeper cuts taking place you will lose all these programs through the middle schools. The public safety chiefs have come and told you we need more than we currently have. You're going to have to live with that. That means less emergency services or not as many services to cover all the people in town, the growing number of people in town. That's where we are. That's the situation. We've done this for 15 years since the last override. It's many, many more years than just about any other town of any size or wealth has gone through. This is where we are. I understand that everyone has crisis, everyone has expenses, every, but if you have income coming in on a weekly basis or monthly basis, that kind of supplements. But if you don't have an income, I mean, if it's $10 every month and that $10 is going to be for the rest and you have to work with that $10, right. it, you, you either go without food to pay your rent or pay your heat because you want to be warm, right? right? So you pay the necessities. And I'm sure the town has the same problem, only the town has the advances of, um, advantage of doing other things to, to get some revenue, where I don't have that possibility. That's what I'm trying to say. <coughs> but I see that my tax bill has gone up already. Now if this two and a half goes, is going to be increased some more, right? right? So, but then the gentleman said that they do that only for five years. Now, what happens after five years? Does it go down? Does the tax rate get cut because the override has kind of reached the peak and that's it? I don't think so. It never goes back down. 
Right. And over I won't go back down. Okay. But That's just just to, just as the costs don't go back down. I wanted to express my opinion. Give you oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I had a, a question also about state aid. So um, how has the impact of what the state gives us impacted our overall town budget? <coughs> I can do you want me to, I could speak about Chapter 70 funding, sure. which is the largest source of state aid that we have. Um, so over the, over the last five years, um, the uh, we have received about a 1% increase each year in Chapter 70 funding. 1%. About 1% increase each year. So that, that comes out to a little over $100,000, so give or take. Um, and the, the, the biggest reason why is we've reached the, the level that the state says that they need to give us additional funding. So essentially, because it's a pretty complicated formula, but because um, Reading is deemed a community that can afford education because of, it, of its property values, um, we don't receive as much state, Chapter 70 state funding as other communities. Just to um, add on, I'm just looking up a chart in our uh, April town meeting book here. Um, for the FY19 next year, uh, state aid is 15% of our revenues. Um, before the last override, it was 20% of our revenues. <clears throat> so, uh, as meager as property tax increases are at uh, between three and three and a half percent, including new growth, they have vastly outstripped the increase in state aid. Um, had state aid been even just keeping up with property taxes, we would not be in as dire straits. So, uh, the state faces the same challenges as the prior homeowner and as the town. A various, you know, source of fixed costs going up at high rates, faster than income. So towns really have to do more for themselves. Absolutely. <laughs> it's up to the residents to take care of themselves locally more than it was the case 20 years ago. Sure. Um, you mean for next year? For next year's budget. For next year's budget. So just to give a little context, a circuit breaker is actually a grant that the, the state gives to um, communities um, for special education services. If a child's services exceed, I believe this year it's $42,000. Um, and so that, that comes through a variety of means. It could be services, it could be out of district placement. You cannot do transportation. So it has to be services. So if it's over $42,000, we would receive a certain percentage of that amount. Um, over the last few years, the state is reimbursed at 70 to 75%. Um, for next year, the funding that we would be receiving, it's at 65%. So what, what that meant to us uh, for the, the budget is it's a $200,000 decrease in, in uh, circuit price for reimbursement. And the reimbursement is on the difference between whatever it costs, say 60000 and the 42000 cap? Mm -hmm. so That's yeah. correct, yeah. It's on, yes. it's on that difference. Yes, correct. Right, at the 68%. I had a follow-up question. Um, so the circuit breaker got from about 75 to 70 and the reimbursement to 60 <coughs> The, the good news is that this affects every community. So there is a, so there is a lot, it, it affects every, every it, so the good news is, is there's a lot of pressure um, at the state level to get that back up to 75% in future years. So writing your legis state legislator helps. Send them an email. But, but I do want to reemphasize uh, Sherry's point earlier. The state's economy is booming. <clears throat> State aid to schools is going up 1% and they're cutting circuit breaker. What's going to happen when the state economy turns? We have to be more self-reliant. It's just as clear as day. And I think, too, it's not all, these pressures are not only on Reading. The reason the state circuit breaker reimbursement rate is lower is because there have been so many claims from so many communities. It's not that it's growing vastly 
more at a faster rate in Reading. Questions, comments? Bob, I was under, under the impression that there is some kind of um, program offered by the town that senior citizens could volunteer their time and services to provide them with some amount of tax relief. But I'm not quite sure how that works. Would you be willing to speak to that? Sure. Um, I believe our, our assessor is chasing down one, one such resident right now. <laughs> Um, every year there is there is many forms of senior tax relief. Um, the one that's been discussed most most uh, clearly tonight, we're we're only the third community in the state to offer anything like this, um, and it's something to be very proud of and it's had a significant impact. But there are lower impact, not necessarily lower, less meaningful ones for certain seniors that qualify, um, anywhere from tax relief outright to a, if you will, tax work-off program where seniors can work so many hours at various tasks through the town uh, and earn a portion of their tax bill that way. Uh, and again, this is all coordinated through the uh, Board of Assessors and, uh, and Victor, who will be back at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> More questions? Not. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and uh, I'll get out and vote on uh, next Tuesday, I guess. Motion to adjourn. What happened to Barry? Where'd he go? Barry, he's, a, he's over there. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Thank you, everybody, for coming and participating. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Bob. Yeah.